Good evening. Uh, my name is Glenda Carr. I am one of the co-founders and president and CEO of Higher Heights for America. Thank you for joining us for our third in a series of author talkbacks as part of our hashtag Black Women Lead political webinar training series. Uh, and so we are embarking, it is actually officially fall now, um, on an amazing conversation with uh, some of the leading black women authors um, who have released books, um, who are releasing books or have released books over the last year. And, and we threw in some amazing um, throwbacks. It is part of our Chisholm 50 celebration. Um, many of you know this is the 50th anniversary of Shirley Chisholm's being sworn into Congress as the first black woman. And so to commemorate uh, her uh, and her legacy, unbought and unbought legacy, we are releasing a series of uh, Chisholm 50 lists. The first list were 50 amazing elected black women. Uh, in the summer, we released um, um, the Chisholm 50 authors um, re summer reading list. Uh, it, some of it came out of that our team we're all asking what books we were reading. And I was like, how amazing would it be if we pulled together a list of 50 must reads for the summer? And we are so excited that seven of our authors have agreed to do an author talk back. Uh, this is the first time we've ever done this. Um, so there is actually still time for you to invite your network to participate not only on this webinar, but also um, the webinars coming up. So as many of you are aware, Higher Heights is the political home for black women. Um, a place where we can create a community to be informed, engage, and to take action. Um, and this is just a piece of the work that we do, which is we want to train um, and engage black women who are thinking about running for office, women, um, black women who are currently running for office, and frankly, like most of us, like me, finding a place where I can um, engage in um, strengthening my political engagement. Uh, and I think we all agree that we live in times where um, all hands are on deck. Uh, and each one of us have a role to play. And so let me give a couple of housekeeping rules, or not rules, but engagement. Um, so during this, we want you to be engaged. You can go and share um, conver the conversation on your social media channels. If you're following us on Twitter, it's at Higher Heights. On Instagram and Facebook, it's at Higher Heights, the number four. Um, please tag our, um, our, our speakers today at Y Caraway, at Leah Daughtry, at Mignon M, actually it's at I am Mignon, uh, and tag me at Glenda Carr, G-L-Y-N-D-A. Um, we are going to actually open this up for a conversation later on, and we are asking you to engage. So if you'd like to ask a question, you can ask that question if you're logged in via your computer in the attendee chat room, which is to the uh, left of the screen, or you can text 646-206-5931 if you're listening. 646-206-5931. And so I am so excited uh, for the conversation today. Um, it is a conversation with the color girls. Where's my, I'm like, where's my book? and put my book somewhere. But if you haven't read the book, this is set up in a way where you can do a couple of things. I'm like going to be obsessed until I find my book. It's on my desk somewhere. It is, if you haven't read the book, um, you can follow along and be a part of this conversation. If you've read the book, you'll, you'll get some of oh, Thank you. There you go. <laughs> um, <laughs> and be like, I got my book too. Uh, if you are in the middle of the book, uh, if you're listening to the book, uh, like I did, because um, that's how I get through books, I listen to books on Audible. Um, it is a great way to, um, a great insight. And I think they will share that this is not only, you know, a little bit memoir, a little bit playbook, a little bit conversation about um, friends and sister girls. And so without, you know, I kept going, how am I going to introduce them? Because I know each one in the middle, that's not how I want to be introduced. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a, I think in the last chapter of the book, I'm going to, to to paraphrase something in the last chapter or the second last chapter in the book where they actually talk about themselves. Um, so who are the color girls? A black girl from Brooklyn, you know, actually let me back to context. So in the book it talked about our, our mothers and grandmothers and the mothers and the grandmothers of the movement, um, like the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Ida B. Wells and the Coretta Scott Kings, did they imagine 
could they have imagined where we are and where we could be? And I've always said that. You know, I'm the great great daughter, great granddaughter of Carol Lee Dickens. She was born in 1895 and died shy of her hundredth birthday. And she dreamt a dream for me bigger than I could have ever imagined. She dreamt the world that a little black girl didn't have could could not be confined by a concrete ceiling or walls or a door. And so I think that is who the color girls are. And so our ancestors dreamt of these um, these six women and the four, the the three that are joining us today, which is could we have imagined a black girl from Brooklyn could be the CEO of the Democratic National Convention not once but twice the same convention that once refused to seat Fannie Lou Hamer. Could we imagine a girl from the south side of Chicago would one day rise in the ranks of Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition and become CEO of a major party and hold two major positions at the White House, becoming the first black uh, assistant to the president and director of public affairs? Could we have imagined a black girl from upstate New York, city of Rochester, would hold key leadership positions in every major presidential campaign to advise and counsel organizations like the Congressional Black Caucus and the Hispanic Caucus in the United States um, Department of Commerce. And yes, we can imagine that. Um, and that is who we're going to be talking to today, three of the color girls. So welcome, ladies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, let's just show the slide because we made a slide. Up oh, the color girls. <laughs> 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 so ladies, this is like I said, I've had an opportunity to hear a couple of talkbacks from you. It is different every single time. I will share with y'all, you never know what they might say. Um, there's always a great tidbit, uh, a great lessons learned. And so I think I want to start because this is a, a book series to just share like, wh why did you decide to share your voice and your story in this way? Uh, and then for something I don't think I've ever asked, and then how did you guys come up with the title of the book? Oh, okay, I'll start. Um, I, it, to make a long story short, we, we were afforded an opportunity to um, do a TV pilot. It didn't quite turn out the way we wanted it to. So we decided, and after we talked to a lot of people, um, we got some really good advice and that we should define ourselves before we let anybody else define us. Um, the movie pilot didn't turn out right. It was not what, who we were or who we wanted to be, and but it was uh, it was a it was a good learning experience. And we just thought we had at this point we had a lot of stories to tell. We had a lot of great stories to tell um, for the last thirty years about our friendship and also about the po political campaigns that we've been involved in, in uh, as well as other things. Um, so we just decided to write, we decided to write the book. And the way we got to the title was we did a program on Sirius uh, with Mark Thompson and Darlena Maxwell. And this was the, when we walked in, they had these big posters that said, for colored girls who have considered politics. And we all kind of looked at it at the same time and we said, oh, this is the title of the book. So that's kind of how it came about. And, and I would add to that, I think we all, um... You know, it's hard to be a black girl in America and not be familiar with for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. And that seminal work by Intazaki Shange, which really defined a generation of uh, of black women and was the 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 example of of black women's stories being told in their own voice and the experience of black women being told through their own eyes, through their own perspectives, and in many respects, stories we had not, that the general public hadn't heard before. We all know them because you know other Black women who had been through these sorts of things, but it was the first time they'd been captured in that kind of way. And so, you know, the, the serious um, radio uh, posters really resonated with our own appreciation for Intazaki Shange's work and in, in, in our way telling our stories um, that hadn't been told before and providing a perspective uh, that people may or may not know. And so we reached out to Ms. Shange before she passed away and her publicist and agent and all that to get permission and her blessing really to, um, to play off of her title 
and she was very gracious to grant that. So uh, that's the that's the back half of the uh, of the of the title of the book. Good. And so what I love about how the book is structured um, is it interweaves your individual lives and then your collective lives. So, you know, my family, my brother and I are huge Wizard of Oz fans, and we can argue, you know, Wiz, Wizard of Oz, but, you know, the word Wizard of Oz is that, you know, you guys were on your own kind of yellow brick road. Um, and so you just assume, you know, fast forward 2019, you guys have known each other forever. Um, and what I love about the journey, it is still the journey of what I call Blackdom, and, and particularly Black Women Network, right, in, in, who are particularly working in a particular industry. There's still just a few of us. We, at one point, will connect. But your, mm -hmm. like, Yellow Brick Road, you know, all started, your roots in activism all were rooted in the strong women and um, family members uh, and in your own realization of your own activism. And then I just loved the storyline of how you just ended up kind of either connecting uh, and in taking those connections, not only to build power, but also to build um, a lifelong friendship. So if you could just share a little bit about, I would love to hear <laughs> um, your first um, interactions with each other. Um, and what, and then I'll add, because I don't think you really talk about it, but like, what were your impressions? Uh, can I talk? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Who is this, Donna? Yeah. Oh, hi, oh, hey. Donna. Hey. hey. <laughs> It was going to be like tonight, given the the political news that we've all learned about over the last 24 hours. Uh, I just want to add to what Yolanda and Leah said, is that we knew, I think, from the moment we began our activism, that we were color girls, that we come from a long line of black women, women of color, who have knocked on doors and struggled to get our seats at the table. I first met... My first color girl was uh, Yolanda Carraway when I was uh, uh, a, a Hill staffer uh, slash intern slash activist. Coretta Scott King pulled me away from Capitol Hill because I wanted to help uh, make Dr. King's birthday a national holiday. And I was lobbying on a hill, and I met Yolanda Carraway, who was then an assistant to uh, then Congresswoman Barbara Mikulski. My impression was that um, she was overdressed. I was not uh, properly attired, uh, which is still the case some some forty plus years later, almost forty. But what I what I've learned from Yolanda, along with Leah and Mignon, is grace, humility. They are courageous women, um, and as we enter this period right now, where we're about to see the country go through a, a massive political fight. I woke up this morning thinking about the battle back in 1998, 1999, when Mignon mm -hmm. and I were over at the DNC and how bleak and dark that moment was. And yet, I do believe we came through. So, um, and Leah, I mean, my, I, I drove with some other uh, young activists from Louisiana to go to Brooklyn for a Forward Together, Back Was Never uh, event at uh, Leah's uh, father's church. And that was another a big moment in my life where I felt the power, not just from Leah's uh, father and the gathering that he had, but from all of the sisters that were in the church. Do y'all call it a church, Leah? You know I'm Catholic. Everything is a church. Uh, <laughs> but I, what I felt was the power. And that, that 20 hour drive back to Louisiana, that 20 hours didn't feel like nothing because I was so empowered from being in the presence of so many great people. So our journey is a, is, is a journey that started off with all of us having a call in and, and answering that call to service. Yeah. So I actually met Donna at the Dukakis. Well, I knew Donna from the 1984 campaign. And when I arrived in Boston, Donna uh, was supposed to be my cohort and my partner in crime because she was already on boycott doing the classic Donna move. So I'm like, I called Donna on the phone. I said, hey, Donna, where are you? She says, well, I'm on boycott. I'm not coming back. I said, well, what do you mean? How do you boycott a campaign? Don't we have a time to begin and a time to end? 
are you going to end the boycott before the campaign or are you going to end the boycott after the campaign? So then I soon learned that she was on the boycott because she wanted some money for the Congressional Black Caucus. You know, anybody that wants to get the black vote, you at least want to have some presence like we had here just here recently with all the candidates. And so she had, she took a very principled move to say, I'm not coming back till they give me that money, which they did. She finally came back. And so that kind of started our little lifelong journey. I became her yin and she was my yang. And I think Leah was kind of the baby of the group. She was somewhere off in Dartmouth trying to be the educated and the intellectual. (laughs) And we were out here on the streets and she knew of us because we knew her father. Her father was somebody that we all revered, admired, and loved. And Yolanda was uh, working at the Rainbow, I think, when I met her. And she used to come to Chicago. And Yolanda is absolutely correct. She has never been undressed. She's always been dressed appropriately. And that's that person you always aspire to get those heels and those purses. Huh? Yeah. I mean, she was like the, she was the well-dressed one. (laughs) And we all wanted to be that one. And so we kind of gathered, and we had another journey. Yeah, I, um, Donna referenced, my father was uh, the chair of the National Black United Front, which was an activist, nationalist, pan-Africanist organization, in addition to being our pastor. So Donna happened to come up for um, uh, in Buff's uh, first national convention. I didn't meet her then. I think the first one I met was Yolanda during uh, right after the 84 Jackson campaign and we we're putting together Rainbow Push. And my father was chair of the bylaws committee. And so, and Yolanda was the ED or whatever, whatever the big title was. She was in charge. <laughs> and I met her first. Uh, and I thought, she seems really organized because she's managing this whole conference. And, you know, she was, you know, as the other girls have said, uh, very well dressed and she had on really good shoes, which is what I noticed first. (laughs) And she had her portfolio and, you know, I was like, Ooh, she's real organized. And my father said, that's Yolanda Carraway. And he's proceeded to tell me about Yolanda. And I said, okay. So she was the first one I met. Um, And then when I moved to Washington, uh, my my father is, wasn't all that hepped up on me moving. He's my father's older. He's from Georgia. He, he grew up in a particular kind of atmosphere, and he's one of these that believe women shouldn't leave home until they're married. So he was <laughs> not all that hepped up on me. Not on not just leaving home, but moving to Washington. So he said, "Well, if you're gonna go, then this you gotta find Mignon Moore." And Don, Donna Brazil, uh, you already know Yolanda because those are black women who are doing something and you need to know who they are. And I was like, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, yeah, okay. Uh, but I don't <laughs> think I actually met um, Mignon until uh, she was in the White House and I was at, at the Labor Department and we, had, we worked on projects together. And then mm-hmm. we met, the, I met Donna later. And so, uh, so sometime during, or right after the 88 campaign. So it was, um, that's how we all connected. And it's the, 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 if there are not four colored girls, there are five. So our other sister, Tina Flanoy, who, uh, uh, leads a very busy life as president Clinton's chief of staff. She's the fifth colored girl. And I met her after Yolanda, cause she was working at the DNC as the head of the rules and bylaws committee. So I got to see Tina and Yolanda pretty much every day when Ron Brown was chair uh, for four years and then hooked up with Mignon and Donna later on. And we along the way became a set, I guess. Uh, I was Terry McAuliffe's chief of staff. And uh, when I became his chief of staff, we started having dinner regularly so that I could make sure that my politics were right uh, and that I was getting the right kind of advice. And so we would have dinner at least once a month, sometimes more, depending on what was happening. And we just kind of roll through the politics of the day, the politics of the country. And, you know, that's really how this sort of set of five began. Um, and we've just been running buddies uh, 
ever since, you know, no better set of women to be in a bunker with. Um, Because when when trouble happens and trouble does happen, everybody kicks in, everybody's got their role. We get on the phone, we decide to do about whatever the problem is. And, and then we just decamp and everybody does their part. And, you know, we try to make a difference for our people. That's right. Miss Yolanda, Miss Destra. Oh, okay. I thought everybody. Miss <laughs> Destra. Oh my. Goodness. But yes, I, Donna. Donna was definitely the first one. I was working for Barbara Mikulski when she was a congresswoman, and I was the. They used to call it the robo operator. It was the. I was in charge of all communications and, and answered all constituency mail. And I hadn't been there that long. And Donna, I was. I was 31, not close to 40. So um, <laughs> I was in my I was in my little cubicle because I didn't have an office, and somebody came in to me one day and said, "There's a young lady out here that I think you probably should come and meet with." And I'm saying to myself, "Why should I come and meet with somebody? And like, why would they ask me to meet with somebody?" And <laughs> when I walked out to the front of the front hall. hall I saw exactly why they told me to come out and meet her because we were both black, of course. But we was, it was a great, you know, it was, and, and as soon as we looked at each other, we kind of laughed because we knew what the deal was. But we've become great friends and been friends ever since. Uh, I met Minya when I first went to work for uh, Reverend Jackson around 1985, I think it was, and she was working, I was working in, in D.C., and I was, uh, I forgot what I was at the time. I had a title. <laughs> she was staff or something of rainbow. Yeah. And and um Mignon was working with Reverend Barrow and we connected that way through uh Rainbow Coalition. And I met Leah when Ron Brown became chairman and I was working on I was the director for the site selection committee for the nineteen ninety two convention. And I was looking to hire somebody and Leah was recommended very highly. Um, I knew her dad. I, 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 I remember her, but I didn't really know her well. I had never interacted with her a lot or worked with her. And she came over for an interview. But I, it, from what I had heard, I knew I was going to hire her, you know, unless she had two heads or something. So <laughs> I, I hired her to work. And that was, that was kind of that was her first convention experience. So we, like, hired each other. She hires me now when she runs the conventions. I come and work for her. You know, we all work for <laughs> each other and support each other. So it's, it's been a good ride. It's been a really good ride. Yeah. 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 And I think that's what's striking in here and is the thread, a, a black woman thread, but particularly, I think, for um, your legacy as, uh, you know, sister friends, um, as colleagues, is the fact that you have helped to kind of connect each other. Um, and the, one of the things I think is interesting is you each kind of have a role to play in your, your own family ecosystem. Um, and so my take of this is, you know, um, one, after reading the book, Yolanda, I was like, yes. And in looking at your great setup, I was like, I so want to be you. You are like the social, the social <laughs> connector. Um, when I talked about, I was like, I need, I need more friends that are social and want to connect, um, you know, other like-minded <laughs> African-Americans, particularly black women, and you're going to convene them. I, I'm closer to Leah. You know, I like to be on my couch by myself and is an introvert uh, and it's quiet and have my to-do list. Uh, I, I, I see as I read and have spent time with y'all is, you know, Donna is definitely the, the disruptor uh, and, and at times the agitator. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, yes. You can see that they're, Donna, they're, we they're are nodding. all nodding. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Mignon is, as y'all talk about, is the glue. Which is interesting because, again, as you know, most people are afraid of the color girl, right? So it is the notion when we first came up with the idea no. of Empire Heights, we, we literally <laughs> were like, okay, we got a call. And we, like, reached out to Mignon and Donna. And Donna was always, she would always respond, this is great. Get, you know, not, not available, but would always respond. We went with <laughs> Leah and our, 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 our church girls. Um, now I became more of a, a, I was like a teen church girl. I wasn't, you were like well, church girl. Women that don't like to make a commitment, but I do show up. You do, well, I'm, uh, getting, I'm, getting, I'm, I'm getting there. And then okay, when, uh, all right, go so, ahead. I'm sorry, I interfere. Okay. And so um, y'all have 
all kind of connected. Um, but literally, it was like, oh, we're going to meet with many on more. Oh, no, oh, no. And so I'm actually sitting yeah. in the office, and our office uh, manager, Takesha, was like, I love Mignon. She's so sweet. And yeah. that literally is. I like, am. I she, am. You are. Lovely. You are. <laughs> and so, so she's, she's cracking up over there. Um, I am. You each kind of. You know, people have their perceptions of who you are. That is what we do as black women to other black women. Um, mm-hmm. But share a little bit of what what makes y'all work, like the different personalities. I do believe, like, my squad, like, it's so funny now, squad is a different meaning, but, like, my squad, we each have a role to play. It is the person that pulls me off the couch. And, I, you know, I'm a cheerleader to somebody. I'm the reasonable, you know, you got, I'm sure there's a the reasonable voice. And then there's a the person that wants to, you know, set things on fire. So what what are the personality traits that make this, professional network of powerful women important and, and more importantly the sisterhood that supports your ability to actually be the leaders that you are i think for me personally i just believe fundamentally that there's no big eyes or no little U's. and if donna is up i'm up if leah is up i'm up if yolanda is up i'm up if any, any, either one of them are hurting i feel like i'm hurting i mean i think that's just I think that's just the nature of the friendship. And I don't know how we've mm-hmm. just learned to support each other when, you know, Donna's interim chair or when Leah is holding down a convention or if I'm, you know, working on Hillary's campaign or if Yolanda is agitating for the DNC to do better. We all tend to just, you know, get in there and be on the same page. Now, we have our disagreements, and most of them are not seen in public. But the truth is I would not – You know, I feel like sometimes my life is just so connected to them knowing that my well-being is okay. You know, we do something as basic as when we travel, we always email each other and just say, hey, I'm on my way to Wisconsin, I'm on my way to California, just so we will know that if that person is off the grid, then we know that, you know, they're off the grid and nothing is wrong. I mean, that's just how connected we stay. And I think we're old enough to not even see, like, it doesn't matter to me whether Leah has a big position or a big contract or Donna is on TV. I frankly do not care. What does matter to me is that if they need me and I, they feel like I am not there, that would bother me. Otherwise, mm. I think we can, yeah, I think we are, we're cool. We know each other's personality. We know when to hold and when to fold. We learned a lot about each other on the road. I think we learned more about each other on the road for the book tour than we even knew because, mm. you know, people think we're together all the time, but we're not, you know, but we just stay connected because we do hear from each other every day on something because we got an email going on something every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like Linda, like, uh, like, Linda, like uh, she likes to sit on, uh, in the window seat, so I can't sit next to Leah because we both like to look out. <laughs> I learned that. I learned that like early on. I'm like, damn, I can't sit next to Leah. She <laughs> likes to look out like me. Um, but you know what it's like. It, 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 it's like I have a large family. I have. I, I was raised with five sisters and three brothers. But there's nothing like people who are with you in day-to-day combat. And whenever I need to know how to calibrate or how to move or even to slow down, I always call Mignon, and there's not one night of my life when it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and I'm wondering if Mignon is home because I know she works late. And then when I like to get up in the morning, and she's already up, and I'm like, how the hell she's burning this, like, at, at our age? And I like to tell her every piece of gossip, every piece of news, so that I don't get in trouble, because sometimes I get in trouble, and I know I get in trouble. I can't help myself. I, I've been trying not to get in trouble. I even went to therapy, and that didn't work. Uh, and so I need to call her. Hey, Glenda, it is a presidential cycle. We are on this trouble mantra. All three of us, we're like, we're going to keep Donna out of trouble for 2020. And it won't work. <laughs> we will not I do go at least a couple of weeks. <laughs> for me, you know, I think it's, 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 it's crazy. It, we know each other well enough now that we were at dinner uh, a couple of weeks ago and Mignon was getting ready to order something. I said, don't get that because it's got sauce on it. You're not going to eat that. <laughs> and the people we were there like, you got 
guys are really friends. I said she doesn't like sauce on her on her food. <laughs> she likes oh, no, she doesn't. And, and if she she's going to get it, she's not going to be like happy. Cynic candles. She doesn't like cynic candles. I wait for her to get flowers and cynic candles, and I just go over there and grab them all up. But when she gets hard <laughs> liquor, and, and it, it's just going to accumulate in her office, and I go get that, they too. They never drink hard liquor. <laughs> it's hard. Oh, but hard liquor. It's, there's a, there's a certain it. confidence and comfort <laughs> in... The friends now look, we drive each other nuts like we did on the road. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I know that if I'm tr- in trouble or if I could, because I'm the one that's most likely to go silent, because mm-hmm. that's just what I do. <laughs> but I but I'm not gonna be in my house dead because they're gonna call after a couple of days. <laughs> and if I'm <laughs> it ain't gonna be a couple of up it's gonna be a couple of hours <laughs> and some soup. I'm gonna have a, a, I'm gonna have soup because Yolanda's gonna bring me some food. Donna's gonna call. so you know there's a certain there's a certain ease and comfort in our lives that we live in this crazy business that we've chosen that says even when we are driving each other nuts we have each other's backs and we are fiercely mm-hmm. protective of each other. It's like I have two sisters. I can talk about them, but you can't. <laughs> Right. right. You know, exactly. And it's that sort of thing that we have over these 30 years, they are my first stop for almost everything. I know they got me. I hope they know I got them. And all mm-hmm. you got to do is call and say, Lee, and I'll be there as fast as I can get there with whatever I have mm-hmm. or don't have, because I'm I'm not going right. to I'm not going to let you fall if it's within my power to do. I'm not going to let you mm-hmm. fall. I'm going to hold you up, stand you up, prop you up, push you up, whatever. And I feel that's how they feel about me as well. And so it's it's a, a, a bond of friendship that's been cemented through the trials and the troubles. Yeah. And we love each other. Yeah. We, we and I want to start like with that. Almost 30 years. Okay. I mean, that's a long time. That's a very mm-hmm. long time. And people in Washington, people in Washington, you know, that you know how it is. Um, they may last a presidential cycle or two, uh, but to be mm-hmm. around and still be relevant after 30 years and still be friends, that, that's mm-hmm. a big accomplishment. And, mm-hmm. and I think for black and women, I, we have to take the risk. Friendship is a risk. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. have to decide that you're going to be open and vulnerable mm-hmm. and let your ugly parts show and and it's okay. And I, at least for me, I, I decided I would take the risk. I think we all did. I would take the and risk. And it's of, not transactional either. You know, you no. don't have to be transactional right. with a friendship, which is good because, you know, I don't want none from them. They don't want none from me. But when they got something right. I want, I just go get it. <laughs> 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 just that simple. It was but, but you it know what's even that. more important? Okay. The, over the mm-hmm. years, we have mentored so many young women and just recently, we went to a um, a bridal shower, and I just mm-hmm. it, it felt so good. I mean, mm-hmm. our quote unquote, our little mentees are just as strong as we are, and mm-hmm. they are now making the same connections that we did. And so, what we started Wonderful. will continue long after mm-hmm. we're no longer here celebrating mm-hmm. whatever we're celebrating—a paperback book mm-hmm. or anything else. And it's such a and joy to watch it, them grow it, up and, and get, get, grow up and fall in love and get married and have children. It's like we're, you know, it's like they're our kids. Our uh, babies, they are grown up. Yeah. Look at y'all. Y'all <laughs> just a guess. I don't even need to be here. Let me just. So, we will um, talk over you. I thought it was important. I know. I thought it was important <laughs> to start with that question because that's what makes this unique, right? Which is the, mm-hmm. the, the, the friendship that has helped to build a foundation for you guys to have been trailblazers. And to be clear, you know, you know, we did, as we know, black women, we don't talk about age, but you know, you, you, I thought it was important to talk about your timeline because people don't recognize that you were in decision-making roles early in your careers, right? And mm-hmm. it's also because you started your activism young, which meant you were able to, to, to use that activism, volunteer activism into your professional lives. Um, so I wanted mm-hmm. to just root the conversation in the, what makes y'all, just so unique, um, but it is you also so into others. Um, you believe that um, we are only as strong as the network. You talk about in the book mm-hmm. during the Clinton years that you guys set up a, what was it called? The Trust Bank of, of Justice. Justice. Bank, Bank of, of Justice. Justice. Bank of Justice. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the ability to say, if we're going to be, if we're going to have seats at the table, that we're going to cre- create more seats. It's not just about having that one seat, that the table is actually big enough for others. So what is your advice to us in this current environment? How do we continue to ensure that we aren't continue having to celebrate first, that we are building tables that are inclusive and in bringing, um, you know, our community and our interests to those tables? Well, Miranda, Trenton, let me start by saying. Go ahead. You want to go, Donna? Go ahead. No, Miranda, I just wanted you. to remind yeah. what you said about Reverend Willie Barrow. You said Reverend Barrow, but Reverend Barrow, I think she weaves through all of our lives in many ways. And I'll never forget she said, we're not as divided as we are disconnected. And mm-hmm. I do believe that that is our biggest problem today. We're not connected to one another. That's why our story is one of connections. We make connections from our different backgrounds, from our different uh, paths that we took. But Reverend Bell and so many of the women that we've worked with, I mean, Leah will tell you about working for Dorothy Height. And, I mean, we just have this, um, you know, amazing history of being connected to women who are already trailblazers in their own right. So I, I don't know. Mignon, I'll, I'll uh, let you regain my time. Oh, great. I'm reclaiming Donna's time. Boy, that's a first. Yeah, that's anyway, <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say was that, you know, I think, Glenda, you are living proof of what it means to really try to empower and connect sisters. I mean, you took a kernel of an idea. You knew that we had tried to start this with, um, what was the name of our group that we had? That We did? We, we we got off to a good oh, start, okay. but I remember, future, yeah, future, future pack. pack. Yeah, and I remember clearly what I said to you. It's tough, but you really need staff, and you can't just do it haphazard. And you doubled down, you and your partners, you guys doubled down. And how many years have you been into this? I mean, we have seen more women on the playing field, and we see ourselves through your pack. I, anytime somebody asks me who to endorse, I either send them to a collective pack or send them to you because I know that you have vetted these folks. I know that you're working with them day in and day out. So that, that to me is just a, you know, it's just the beauty of, you know, what we try to leave behind. But you're making your own legacy now, and hopefully somebody will come behind you and say, okay, she's put this piece together. What do I need to do? And that's all we want people to do is think about what role you can play, especially in this environment, because sitting on the sidelines should not be an option for any of us especially for black women who are now trying to reach 100% of our voting record. We don't want to be 73% anymore. We want to have everybody registered. So just a quick, if you have a question and you're watching this via webinar, you can um, you can put into the attendee chat room. And then uh, I, of course, don't know the phone number. And if you'd like to um, text a question to 646, Six four six. I'm good at a lot of things. Number remembering numbers aren't what is not one of them. Six four six two zero six five nine three one. So there there is a question, and this is a detailed question, ladies. Y'all probably see this on page one oh five of your book. Oh my you God! Ask, <laughs> do men do men in power think of us as mammies? Donna said, I believe they rely on our faith. How can black women today in corporate situations, uh, in corporate situations and trying to get into the political space to help improve how we are perceived by men in our in our space? So pretty much, you know, how do we in, uh, what are we, in 2019 uh, uh, create a narrative around how people are perceiving us as black women, as leaders, is how I'm reading that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that came. I think that came from. Um, I think Donna. It came from Donna. I think that was like almost twenty. It was two thousand, uh, right? When uh, when did Gore run? Two thousand. I think that came from that. <laughs> and yeah, I would say at that point and be and before that, I was around. I've been around since like in national politics since, since nineteen eighty one. And yeah, I do. I I think I did feel feel that way at a lot of times. Is men just. You know, they look for us. I think we were conning and soothing, and 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 uh, they look for us to fix things. Uh, I'll never forget Leah was there at the um, the Martin Luther King dedication, 
the first time, the first one, <laughs> where we had the hurricane and the, so, and the, and the earthquake oh. and, and all this stuff, and we were trying to figure out what to do. And it's like Leah and Flo and all my communications girls, we were like huddled trying to figure out how we handle this. And, I, and mm-hmm. we walk out in the lobby and we see the guys, the leaders, sitting in the corner in a circle. And I kind of went over there and I said, boy, some things never change, do they? <laughs> But yeah, they they did. I think it's a little different now, though. And I'm not involved as much as I used to be, so I'll let the others talk to it. But I think that they're gaining, I know they have more respect for us, but even for the younger women, I think they're gaining more respect um, from all of us because we're proven. I mean, black girl magic has taken over. Mm-hmm. That, that refers I, you know, to... Go ahead, Mia. Go ahead. No, please, go ahead. You know, it refers to when we first got on the stage, y'all, let's not forget that back in the 1980s, I mean, long before Geraldine Farrell, long before, you know, Hillary Clinton, long before all of the trailblazers were going through that proverbial, you know, trying to crack that glass seal, and we were sitting in a room just trying to find a seat. And when we got in the room, we knew we had to make room for others. But the problem was the perception of who we were because they were not accustomed to, one, having women, powerful women, who were just as smart as the quote-unquote white boys, uh, and also women who were opinionated, smart, but also could go and handle just about any assignment they could handle. And we stepped up at a time when perhaps they didn't see women of color stepping up, and we had to fill a lot of gaps. But one of the things I'm most proud of is that when we got into the room, we made room for others. We didn't just think Mm -hmm. about ourselves. We Mm -hmm. made room for others. And as I tell some of the young women today in the Democratic Party and other places, you don't have to cuss nobody out because many of us cuss them out for you. If walls could talk, they could hear my words. And Leah's on the phone Mm -hmm. today, uh, just in case I curse, to clear me up. Uh, but the, the truth is, is that we had to fight our way in, but we never shut the door when we got in. We kept it open for everybody else. Well, I and I, w- I think I would say it just a little bit differently because, you know, I, I think we were in very unique positions because we were, we got, we got piloted into a lot of these powerful places because of our relationship with Reverend Jackson, and he had over prepared us because we were under-resourced in about everything that we did with him. So when we got to the table with them and they had resources, you know, they would be all discombobulated and we would be at the table Mm -hmm. thinking, well, shoot, we can get this done in the next five minutes. And so some of it was just our preparation. And, you know, I know Reverend Barrow used to say all the time, let preparation be your friend, not your enemy. And so just being prepared is just one half of the battle. The other half of the battle is what Donna just said. When you get to the table, are you looking to your left and are you looking to your right? You know, many of us that have been in leadership positions always, always, always have to go in that door saying, is this place reflective of my values? Is this place reflective of a place I would want to work at? And is there somebody else I can swing the door open, Leah's famous words, swing the door wide open to let them come in? And people think that's passe, but that is almost a job for us. How do we keep empowering people to run these campaigns, to run these businesses, to become filmmakers? You know, we might not be in these venues, but we feel like we touch every 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 portal of America. We feel like we're touching it. And I feel like we should be touching it. If you're a filmmaker, then how many filmmakers are you making? If you're a PAC leader, are you thinking about who's the next person that comes behind you? If you're a business mogul, if you're a bishop, you can't just become a bishop. you got to go through some training. So, Leah, I guess you're going to have a harder journey than we will. <laughs> but <laughs> the point is, we are all trying, I think we all try to believe in our souls and our hearts that we were taught the right values. Because we don't want to do this all our lives. I mean, we want them to be able to do, we want to be able to use our intellectual capital to help them. And it's hard sometimes because you wish you just had, you know, more people on the playing field, but, you know, it is what it is. So um, one of the questions that came through via text I'm going to add on to with some context is literally uh, the color girls have been, um, you know, have helped to 
um, expand the Democratic tent um, through the, their work at the DNC, the Democratic National Convention. At times, they've you, you guys have you know expanded, restructured, um, you know pushed the envelope uh, throughout the decades. And so, would love to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, we worked with with we were part of uh, the group of Black women who uh, wrote um, a letter to then the new chair, um, Tom Perez. Um, I remember, um, I'll, I'll call it now that we, now that I know it's in the book, uh, we called Leah Gepetto <laughs> during that moment. Uh, and she's like, you know what, I think we need a letter. <laughs> not, saying, not saying it came from me, but there should be a letter. It was on a Saturday, right, Leah? It was you, and I'm not going to name the other person, I'm not going to out her. <laughs> and so I sat in a cafe in Connecticut, Connecticut and drafted the outline of that letter. And so would love to hear your thoughts. I forgot okay, about and this that. Is at a time. Remember, because <laughs> you were your best though. So. Uh, <laughs> and um, and it was after obviously the 2016 uh, election cycle, coming off of um, all of your, you know, engagement not only uh, with the can with the candidates, but also with with the party. And then I remembered, I don't know why I was in the Valley, of Leah, but the sitting in the back of that room when you, you know, preached a sermon about Black women being absolutely seen. Um, what mm -hmm. is your thoughts now about the work that we did that ultimately, you know, I think catapulted um, us sitting in Yolanda's, you know, first uh, NCNW basement to Yolanda's planning room for Power Rising is the mm -hmm. work that you did in the, in the 80s and the 90s with the party, how y'all felt in 2016-17 around how Black women externally from the work that we do, how they felt a disconnect uh, to a party that they have helped to build as voters um, and not feeling they mm -hmm. had their return on their investment. Like, what is your feeling? And, in, and I think turning that to an action, because your book is a playbook, what do we individually as everyday citizens need to do to continue to build um, and rise, um, rise our power in, in, in democracy? And then frankly, as leaders, what, are your, what is your advice in this moment for black women? Well, I think, and all of us have been involved in the party for many, many years. And, and for me, um, it is a source of frustration uh, that the party continues to not do all that it should or can to engage uh, the base of its party at a level that is commensurate with the support that the base gives the party. Uh, so it, I, I just get, you know, frustrated, angry, and then sometimes just apathetic, just y'all go, y'all go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> and just don't want to be bothered with any of them. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work to be done there. And, and un unfortunately for our community, uh, there's not a whole lot of viable alternative, uh, particularly given the time that we're in. You know, I'm not going to tell people not to vote for, you know, a Democrat, even though I'm not all the time happy with the Democratic Party, because what's the alternative? <laughs> the party mm -hmm. of Trump um, or, or not voting? Not voting is not an option. So, you know, it's, you know, the lesser of, lesser of, of, of 49 evils in some respect. And, and at the same time, look, Jesus is not on the ballot. There's no per perfect candidate. Um, and so you got to make choices among those who have stepped forward to run. I, th I, think what, I think what we can do as citizens, and sometimes I don't think we do as, as the best job of this, is to hold, is to find ways to hold candidates, elected officials, and the party accountable for their actions. We oftentimes elect people that we believe in, and then we don't get, we don't go back to say, did you vote? How'd you vote? What you doing for me? What have you done for me lately? We just assume mm -hmm. that they've been elected and are going to do the right thing. And that's not good enough. And our list of things to do is miles long, but, you know, as if you've been to any of the book talks, I always advocate for people, go find the elected you voted for. They work for you and ask them, what are they doing for you? Uh, it, it's, they gotta have, you got to get them a performance check like your, like your boss gives you one. 
uh, in order for them to keep their job. And if they're not going to perform at the level uh, that to which you think they should, then they need to be fired and you go get somebody else. We got to figure out a way to do that with the party, the party apparatus. Right. Because the electeds are one part of the party, but there's the party apparatus, the DNC and the Congressional Campaign Committee and the Senatorial Campaign and all of these others that we also who are always asking us for money and want us to turn up and right. the state parties and the county parties. And what are they doing and how are they investing in us in terms of contracts, in terms of hiring, mm -hmm. in terms of responsiveness? Because Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand, never has, never will. And if we don't demand it, force it and hold people accountable, we just stay in the same mud pile cycle to cycle and, and it's hard to advance. I agree. Mm -hmm. Any other piece of that is that the party does well when one of us is in leadership, right? When there's somebody right. black right. And committed to the culture right. and committed to the cause is at the right. head of the party. When Manyan was the COO or, or Donna yeah. was running a campaign, then you find it, it is responsive because it can be. But it's okay. not in the culture of the institution. So then when we step away or the, whoever the black person is in charge steps away, then it reverts. It's a big behemoth, okay. this party. And, and, and that's that is it is a is it's in the DNA to not be responsive. <laughs> It's in the DNA mm -hmm. of the party. And so we've got to shift it so that it, it shouldn't matter that there's a black woman in charge and there's a black woman CEO because the party should be responding to us on the basis of the fact that they get 95% of our vote and you can't win a democratic nothing without us. That should be enough. And we've mm -hmm. just, and we've got to continue to fight to make the party respond to us and make the party do the right thing. They're not going to just cause we, just cause it, just cause it's the right thing to do. Nobody ever gives up power willingly. Yeah. All my life. I had to fight. Had to fight. <laughs> Girl, Charlie. Oh, so we are, are narrowing down. We do try. We do try to keep this to, to a power hour. I should have known this should have been a power two hours. So I think you know. I think Higher Heights would love to do this in person um, and figure out mm -hmm. a Sunday brunch uh, that makes sense. Oh, I want to um, come to that Sunday the, brunch. Me too. I want to come. I, I, I mean, I'm like, I want to just come to the brunch. I get those emails, and I just feel like I need to be going down the street somewhere to the brunch. Me too. <laughs> like, where the brunch at? And so, so I want to, I want to comment on what Mignon said about higher heights. Um, okay. You all are playing an invaluable role today in American politics and lifting up Black women candidates. I know Jennifer, Jennifer, Car um, Jennifer Mitchell. Uh, Miller Domsar mm -hmm. in Mississippi running for secretary yep. of the attorney general position. Please continue to do what you can to help black women mm -hmm. all over the country who are running in important races. We have so many black women running in the Virginia state legislature on November 5th and in the New Jersey state legislature November 5th, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the state legislature. So we need your help. We need your support. Please support uh, Higher Heights. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, there are uh, amazing Weaver, black women Amber running. Mignon, Mia Weaver, and there's a wonderful black woman running for mayor in the great city of Memphis. So please, Higher Heights, go to the website and support these ex excellent female candidates. Yes. And before you move off of this point, Glenda, can we just can we just make one quick point that we raised at an uh, event we were just at? The mayor of Flint, Mayor Weaver. She has a challenger now. Now, she has basically yep. had to carry the brunt of the bad water that was bestowed upon her, and it's finally, you know, turning the corner just ever so slightly. So to whoever your listening audience is, I hope that you will find in your heart to give her $5, $10, go campaign mm -hmm. for her, go knock on doors, because she is a beautiful, beautiful sister, and she needs our help because we don't want to see her not in office, and I don't think she is in fear of that, but I don't think we should take it for granted. Yeah. Here so there are, are, and right? we have to remember, we are so, uh, for where? Um, so the Mississippi AG, a uh, woman for, running for Mississippi AG is Jennifer uh, Riley Collins. Um, mm -hmm. 
and we we forget that there you know everyone is focused on 2020 there are races across this country in 2019 and so yes higher height sports mm-hmm. women running for federal statewide executive office in top 100 cities there are black women running for dog catcher all the way up and so mm-hmm. we um in addition to the work that we do to support um women at running at those levels find a candidate that inspires you and sew into them mm-hmm. and that's sewing into them by opening up your pocketbooks and then um putting on your walking shoes um, or your texting mm-hmm. son. So it actually, this is a great way, Donna. One, one, thank you all um, uh, for the, you know, unsolicited, you know, commercial. Appreciate that. Uh, is who is a woman? And, and this is and this is rapid rapid fire because you talk a lot in this book about women that inspired and sewed into you. So who is a woman um, that you want to uplift tonight? Because I always do that. Like as you can see, I always bring my great grandmother in when I can. Who is a woman that inspired you uh, and sewed into you? And then which black woman? activist, leader, or elected leader or candidate that's currently inspiring you? Well, I guess I'll... Oh, oh. There's so many women that have inspired me. It's hard, it's hard to say. I mean, there's so many women that have inspired me. Um, when I first came to work on the Hill, I was just like, I was like a kid in a candy store. I mean, I wanted to meet Shirley Chisholm. I wanted to meet everybody that was up there, and eventually I did. But one of the there's so many of these women that inspire me. Stacey Abrams inspires the hell out of me. Lucy McBath inspires me because she took her pain and she turned it into something powerful. And there's mm-hmm. so many of these women out here that I just I admire and I and I'm watching I'm watching them because I know that I feel comfortable that I can retire soon. Because they they got it. They really do. They're amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say for me, uh, and I've I posted about this yesterday, and particularly in the times we're living in right now, of course, you know, my grandmothers and my mom and all that, but the, the woman I'm thinking about a lot about these days is Barbara Jordan. Um, as we're watching this impeachment business uh, unfold, mm-hmm. one of my earliest recollections of television was Barbara Jordan at the at the Watergate hearings, and she really sparked my uh, interest in politics and Congress and all of that because that was the only thing on TV was the Watergate hearings, and just the <laughs> st- her strength of character and 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 purpose was so apparent to me, and it's something that. I held as I was growing up and now she comes back to me. And in terms of who's inspiring me right now, you know, I think about the women in Brooklyn, the activists, women like Viola Plummer, who, you know, they're not household national names, but these are the women that grew up around who are still fighting for community oriented things in the way that that they know how and whether that means taking on the power structure, whether that means turn it out of school, whatever it means, just they don't do it so their name is in the paper, they do it for the love of the people and the love of the community. And so they inspire me every single day. Mm-hmm. Well, I I would like to say that I was inspired at an early age from all of the heroines and those who led the civil rights movement growing up in the deep southern state of Louisiana. I just, uh, from Ruby Bridges to everyone who opened doors and knocked down those, they inspired me. But Harriet Tubman is a little girl, my grandmother, who grew up in Mississippi. I don't know why she told that story. And in just a few weeks, uh, because Mignon reminds me all the time, she's Miss Film and Cinema. Um, <laughs> Harriet Tubman, the movie, is going to come out. And I hope we watch that movie because her story, going back 19 times, mm-hmm. uh, an American hero, a patriot, she continues to sp- in- inspire us today. And I hope uh, we will one day have uh, some Harriet Twenties in our wallets and pocketbooks and purses. As 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 of right now, there's so many women who are daring to make a difference, but I have to tell you, I'm going out of school, but I'm going to tell you all the truth. Nancy Pelosi, she gets my amen, my praise the Lord, and thank you, Jesus, all in one voice, because she is daring to make a difference. She's going to hold somebody accountable. So I'm going to go ahead and give it up for Nancy and the members of the Congressional Black Caucus, including Maxine Waters, who she named yesterday as one of the women who will decide on the articles of impeachment. So that is my other sister in the battle for justice and equality. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm going to start. I'm going a little bit outside the polit- political realm, but I'm going to uh, say one person that really inspires me because she understands her platform very well is Ava DuVernay. I have been mm-hmm. inspired by the way she has taken her platform of film and her directorship and lifted up issues that impact our community directly. And the fact mm-hmm. that she has given life to these five brothers, the uh, Central Park Five, it just it delights my heart. Even though they didn't get all the Emmys I wanted them to get on Sunday, there is no greater piece of work, no body of work that has been so central to our community. And, you know, Hollywood is a very strange beast, mm-hmm. and you can either play up to it, suck up to it, but she has made a very deliberate decision that she's going to speak her truth through her film. So she's certainly one of them. And obviously, Cicely Tyson, who is a mentor to all of us. But more importantly, I just think all the women that are out here trying to run for president right now, I think they see how hard it is. It is, you know, mm-hmm. I think when Hillary was running, everybody thought that, you know, you could you could probably name a whole bunch of things things that we did right and a whole bunch of things we did wrong. But one truth is it is very difficult for a president, for a woman to run for president. It's taxing on our life. It's taxing on our family. It's, you know, it's misogyny. It's sexism. So to all of those women who are daring to make a difference, I give them a huge shout out. Well, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I will say that you your book, Yolanda. Um, thank you for sharing your story <laughs> and continuing to inspire. And so I will do their plug. This is a hard copy. You know, it's going to be hard to get this hard copy. This is now going to be the like coveted hard copy. But the paperback is coming out on October what? Is it first? One. Is it first. first, right? First. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you don't if you don't have the hard hard copy, um, please go out. You know how we get to hear more of our stories is support the authors who share their stories. Um, and even though they don't read the book, if, if you know them, you actually hear all their voices from the person that reads it on Audible. So I, you know, get to, as I get my nails done and I go grocery shopping, I got to listen to them um, over the last month or so. So thank you for, again, being um, supporters and champions and cheerleaders of Higher Heights work. Um, thank you for individually supporting, you know, uh, Kimberly and I when it was just an idea from a Brooklyn cafe, didn't know where to start, for you to mm-hmm. not only give advice, say that, you know, the old-fashioned, you know, your skirt, your, your slip is showing. I still wear slips mm-hmm. sometimes. Your slip is showing. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> literally when, <laughs> when, you know, when, um, and what Donna had said is. Is that the same thing as tank, bank? No. Well, Spank, Spank? Yeah, no. Spank can show too. So th- no, but people okay. do say you know. You, as long as some show. undergarment is on. <laughs> yeah, some undergarment. You need to have some undergarments on. And Good foundational randomly, garments. <laughs> to randomly opening the mail and seeing that we've got a handwritten note from Donna Brazil, and then because of how they have sewn into each other's friendship, just even basics that when y'all were on your tour in the winter. I, if y'all remember, I had surgery, and y'all would call from the car mm-hmm. to make sure I was still sitting still. Um, and mm-hmm. I think those are the those are the sister girls we need to continue to cultivate. Those are the aunties, those are the mamas, those are the mentors. That is what Black women are. And so, what absolutely inspired me at the end of the book is I am going to try to be Yolanda. Uh, and so, the notion <laughs> of I want to be able to have. Tuesday night dinners, and what y'all shared about Tuesday night dinners um, with the color girls, it is a place where friendships are made, broken, and healed. So may you continue and to And furniture is and- rearranged. <laughs> <laughs> we rearrange your furniture, too. Okay. Oh, so thank you for, you know, sharing a glimpse of your pathway from young professionals uh, to those who are changing furniture and moving chess pieces and being kings and queen makers. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank and you. So thank, this, you <laughs> thank you, Glenda. And this has been, I, I didn't have to necessarily be here to moderate. They could have moderated on their <laughs> own, but I appreciate <laughs> you allowing us to do that. So this will be, as you know, a video. So please share the video um, because there's just so many tidbits. So this is third in the series. So tomorrow, 
Brittany Cooper, Elephant Rage. Oh uh, boy! Next week, mm-hmm. gonna be, uh, I, I, yeah, that's that's gonna be yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, actually, my understanding is um, Oprah's um, one of her series of Black Women Conversations happens tomorrow night, and Brittany's actually on that episode. So tune in to hear her at seven o'clock, and then tune in to her um, on Own's um, Conversation with Black Women uh, tomorrow. Feminista Jones, a book called Reclaiming Our Space. Um, from from Twitter to the streets. Uh, And then we're finishing off the series with Tiffany Dufu, uh, Drop the Ball, and uh, Jamia Wilson, who is the first black woman to ever be the publisher of Feminist Press. So not only will she talk about her book, but she will also talk about, so you're thinking about writing a book, started to write a book, stopped writing a book, so a little bit how more black women can share their voices. And so Mm -hmm. for the next two talkbacks next week, it is Kimberly Taylor Allen is going to be um, hosting those conversations, and we look forward to you logging in and sharing with your community. And if you're new to Higher Heights, you know, Higher Heights is working to move this country to higher heights. And so by just um, signing up for this webinar, you've been kind of become an active activist member of Higher Heights. And there's a lot of work to be done on this road to 2020 because it is powered by black women. Um, and we look forward to being your political home, the one two, one-stop space for you to be informed, engaged, and to take action to help black women to run, vote, win, and lead. And so thank you, everyone, for joining us um, in this evening. And thank you to uh, Minyan, Yolanda, uh, Leah, and the voice, Donna Brazil. Um, so I'm so kind of happy that your <laughs> media hit got canceled because uh, the, the voice from beyond was, was great. So thanks for joining <laughs> us, ladies. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.